Uh, Meg, all of a sudden the Pacific's become a lot more important. Uh, this government's given us the Pacific step up. Uh, what is that and uh, what should the next government do with it? Well, I think the region's always been important to Australia. I don't think that's particularly new. It's many other players are coming into the region and that's attracted by its political votes in UN, it's attracted by resources uh, and a number of other activities, uh, rich fisheries, etc. So our step up is looking around and seeing there's lots of more people in the region and responding to that by enhancing our own presence. And we're doing that across three areas. One, in security and uh, improving our engagement with security forces and security analysis uh, institutions. And then there's a step up on people-to-people -people relationships through sport, churches, NGOs, education. And uh, finally, a step up on economic engagement, which we'll no doubt talk about a little bit later. Uh, so you can see it's a huge agenda and it's added to what we already do in the Pacific. So when we're looking to the future of what the next government's got to do, uh, slow it down probably is what they've got to do, not add to that agenda, but to demonstrate quality delivery and respond to the cry from the Pacific to say they want genuine partnerships. So if you want genuine partnerships, you've got to talk to people. You've got to make sure that the priorities in these programs fit the priorities in the region. And it's tailored to the very different and very diverse region that we're trying to operate in. So you mentioned uh, one of the aspects of the step up uh, relates to security. Uh, Pacific Island Forum, which is the peak body for the Pacific, uh, talks about an extended security agenda. So what do they mean by that? And how, what are the implications for Australia? Mm. Extended, I think it's actually a bit of a pushback by the Pacific saying, yes, Australia, we hear your concerns about traditional security issues uh, in the Pacific transnational crime, border security, uh, drugs trafficking, etc. But in the Pacific, what's important to us is that nexus between development and security. And we can't just pull them apart. So they're saying the primary concern for us is climate change, actually, mitigation and adaptation. And we need joint attention to that and a continued dialogue on how we're going to respond to it. Beyond that, we're worried about resource security, our food, our water, our energy security. Then we have human security issues <laughs> that are quite pressing in the Pacific. You know, the huge incidence of non-communicable diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. That has to be dealt with to give our youth a good future, livelihoods. And then comes all your national security stuff. So put it together uh, and talk to us about this extended uh, security agenda. And they take that a step further when they look at geopolitics. So they're saying, we hear you about China and the Pacific and why you're concerned about it. And we understand risks of small players playing with big players. But it isn't just a security concern, it's a development opportunity. So we want that access to finances, aid, trade, work with us to bring security and development together and to help us take advantage of these new opportunities coming into the region. Uh, don't narrowly define security in a way that may constrain our development. So that's the extended security agenda. And we have to be able to listen and respond to that and make sure our development interventions do that. And I guess, Stephen, when we're, we're, we're thinking about responding to priorities in the region, the one that comes up again and again is labor mobility. Now, Australia has made some steps on that. but. Where, where do we go? I mean, is it going to be consistently important to the region? And if so, what should that next government be doing mm -hmm. to respond to it? Yeah, I think if you look back over the last 10 years, you know, well, we will look back over the last 10 years and we'll see uh, labor mobility is a really fundamental change mm -hmm. in the way we relate to the Pacific. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago, under John Howard, Australia refused to introduce a seasonal worker program. Mm -hmm. It took a Labor government to introduce that scheme on a pilot. 
uh, and it took the current Conservative government to uh, scale up that scheme. Uh, and it is now really uh, growing rapidly and getting quite large. It's up to 10,000 workers a year from the Pacific and Timor-Leste who come to Australia uh, to pick fruit and vegetables. Um, and the government's gone further to introduce the Pacific Labor Scheme. Currently, it's very small, but uh, that gives Pacific workers the right not to just come for a few months, but to come for three years. And not just to work on farms, but really take any job where an employer wants to hire them uh, outside of the capital cities. And, you know, for the Pacific countries where economic opportunities are pretty limited, uh, where they're not really that competitive uh, in uh, conventional sectors, you know, this is really a, a terrific uh, opportunity for them. And it's become very important. You know, it's, it's the, the amounts of money that workers are sending home through these schemes uh, is now starting to uh, get towards the amount of aid uh, the governments get. Um, but, you know, the great thing about this is that it doesn't cost Australia any money. In fact, this benefits mm. Australia. So it really plays to that agenda of uh, finding things that are in our common interest rather than us being the big brother, you know, helping out, uh, helping out the Pacific. Uh, and the other advantage is this is a private sector activity. So the money goes straight uh, from employers to workers uh, to, their, to their families. Uh, so it's, it's a fundamental change. I think um, it, it's great it's now a bipartisan uh, approach, but I think if we think about the next government and we think uh, you know, there's a, you know, at least a, a likelihood that Labor is going to be the next government, um, you know, migration is a sensitive issue for both parties, uh, but especially with Labor and uh, the trade unions. Uh, you know, they could easily develop a narrative these people are taking Australian jobs and uh, the brakes could be put on these schemes. Mm. Uh, so I think the real test uh, for a Labor government is, uh, is it going to continue uh, with this scale up or, you know, what has been the biggest step up so far, I think, uh, in the area of Labor mobility. Um, and then uh, for both parties, uh, whoever's returned, you know, we, th the agenda is not finished, you know, by any means. I think we, we've started a journey on Labor mobility, uh, but there's a long way to go. And uh, we need to look at um, the permanent migration scheme as well, making it easier for Pacific Islands, Islanders not just to come on temporary work assignments, but to come permanently to build up that diaspora, uh, to represent the Pacific in Australia and to provide that base uh, that will uh, support the islands uh, back home. Because we know with climate change um, and with a lot of environmental pressure, you know, some of these countries are, are simply not viable. And you know, it's not that there's going to be a mass evacuation, but a place like Kiribati uh, in particular, does need uh, to be able to diversify its economy, and the only way to do that is to build up the diaspora in Australia and New Zealand. So another area where we are just beginning the step up, as opposed to having a, a track record on, is this uh, new initiative to get into development banking. And we've recently announced that we're going to launch this $2 billion uh, infrastructure development bank. That's a pretty new area for Australia. And there are quite a few players already in this business. In your view, is this a good step? And should the next government continue down this way, maybe even expanding it? Yeah, I think it's interesting to compare labor mobility and infrastructure, because labor mobility is something we can provide the Pacific that China can't. You know, Pacific Islanders don't want to, they don't have the opportunity to go to China to work. They do want to come to Australia and now they have the, have the opportunity. So that really builds on one of our strengths. Uh, in infrastructure, as you say, that's really a strength of China. And so moving in the infrastructure space, yeah, we're really trying to compete uh, in, a, in an area where China's strong. And mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm skeptical about how well we're going to do. I mean, that said, both parties have come out strongly and said they're committed to this. And there certainly is demand uh, in the Pacific. I think, um, especially with China providing infrastructure, Pacific countries are looking to Australia and say, well, look, can't you do some of that? Sometimes they, they feel our help is rather abstract and uh, advisory. They, they want to be able to see tangible projects. Um, so for good or for bad, we're, we're heading down this route. As you said, there's been this $2 billion announcement. That's not going to be reversed by Labor. I think one thing you said really applies to this, which is just slow it down. You know, let's, okay, we're going to go into this space, but let's do it carefully. Yeah. I think there are a number of issues that really haven't been thought through, uh, mm. you know, in particular around debt sustainability. 
you know, we're, we're providing this $2 billion mainly in loans and in non-concessional loans. And the Pacific has very limited ability uh, to absorb those loans and pay them back. And, you know, we don't want to be part of, a, of the next debt crisis. Uh, so I think we need to rethink the financing terms and uh, we need to think through more carefully uh, issues around the, the policy framework uh, to make sure the infrastructure is going to be, uh, going to be well used. That's right. So we can see that, that this is a big agenda. This is going to continue and will have to be sustained and a demonstration of our commitment to the region uh, sustained in the long term. And where the capacity is not as strong to help us implement this huge agenda, we're going to have to think about how we're building it, how we're twinning, how we're exchanging.